They were the cream of the crop, the um, epitome of aristocracy, elevating the art of karate to new heights. Hello everyone, I'm Tim. Today we're going to be talking about the origins of karate and a common misconception about its creators. Take a step back in time to the kingdom of Okinawa, when karate was still in its embryonic stage. Picture the rolling green hills, the regal palaces and the thriving cities of this kingdom. Surrounded by the Okinawan aristocracy, the elite members of society who were the pioneers of karate. See, contrary to what many believe, karate was not born from tough farmers, but from the Okinawan nobility. They were the feudal lords, dukes and princes who had the means to hone their skills, the wisdom to pass it down and the influence to spread it beyond the kingdom. They were the cream of the crop, the um, epitome of aristocracy, elevating the art of karate to new heights. I mentioned Sokon Matsumura before, click right here for a great story about him. He was a karate master of great renown. He was known as the warrior Matsumura or Bushi Matsumura and his life was filled with honor and prestige. As a court member and the bodyguard of the Okinawan king, he was a true uh, embodiment of karate royalty. His mastery of karate was unmatched and would have made him a suitable court member in the courts of Europe's great monarchs, if not for his fearsome reputation that preceded him. Matsumura was a true martial arts legend, known for his incredible fighting abilities and his unwavering defense of his kingdom against any foe. His skills were passed down to a select few students, one of whom was Choki Motobu. Motobu came from a noble background as well and was just as feared as his teacher. He too became a legend in the martial arts world, known for his incredible fighting abilities. Motobu and Matsumura were not just masters of karate, they were protectors of their people, preserving the art for future generations. Together, Matsumura and Motobu were part of a group of martial artists dedicated to honing their skills to perfection and preserving karate for future generations. Their passion for this ancient discipline was contagious and inspired many others to follow in their footsteps, to strive to emulate their greatness and to continue their legacy. These two karate legends were true pioneers of the art, shining examples of what it meant to be a true martial artist, dedicated to preserving and growing their discipline. Then there was Kanryo Higaona, a true martial arts master, who achieved greatness despite his humble origins. Higaona's background was in stark contrast to that of Okinawa nobility, but he had still managed to earn a place among the elite of Okinawan society. This was a testament to his skill, his dedication and his unwavering commitment to the art of karate. Higawana was driven by a passion for martial arts and he was not content to stay in Okinawa and simply bask in the prestige of his membership in the aristocracy. Instead, he set his sights on honing his skills even further and set out for China to study under the great masters of the day. He spent years there training tirelessly, absorbing the wisdom of the elders and learning the secrets of the most advanced techniques. When he returned to Okinawa, he was a changed man, with a new depth of knowledge and a mastery of the art that was unmatched. He took on Chojun Miyagi, the founder of Goju Ryu, who was himself of noble descent. As a student, Higaona shared all that he had learned in China with Miyagi. This was a gift of immeasurable value as Miyagi was able to build on Higaona's teachings to create a truly unique and powerful style of karate. Miyagi was known for his quiet demeanor and his unwavering commitment to the principles of martial arts. He was a true gentleman and he was greatly respected by all who knew him. In the end, Higaona and Miyagi's friendship and collaboration cemented their place in the annals of martial arts history. Higaona's humble origins and his rise to the top of the Okinawan aristocracy was a true testament to the power of hard work, dedication and a passion for martial arts. And Miyagi's unwavering commitment to the principles of martial arts and his gentle spirit were a true inspiration to all who knew him. Together, they represented the best of what it meant to be a martial artist and their legacy lives on to this day, inspiring generations of martial artists to strive for greatness. See, these Okinawan nobles also played a critical role in promoting the use of weapons in karate, such as the tonfa, uh, nunchaku and bo, despite misconceptions that they were simply transformed farming tools. The evidence shows that they were actually developed for military use. The Okinawan nobles also helped spread karate beyond their kingdom by traveling to Japan and teaching the people and military about this martial art. 
Similarly, in the West, noblemen and landed gentry made substantial contributions to the growth of martial arts. They supported fencing disciplines like rapier fencing, saber fencing and small blade dueling, and provided financial support to fencing schools, preserving these arts for future generations. Just like their Okinawan counterparts, they traveled the world, sharing their skills and knowledge, ensuring the survival and evolution of martial arts. Imagine you found yourself transported back to the Ryukyu Kingdom, where karate was still in its early stages of development. As a member of the Okinawan aristocracy, you had the privilege to train with some of the greatest masters in the world. You threw yourself into your training, learning the delicate intricacies of this ancient discipline and striving to reach a level of mastery that would make the Okinawan nobles proud. You were surrounded by the like-minded individuals, all passionate about the art of karate and dedicated to preserving it for future generations. Each day you trained with the greatest focus and discipline, driven by a deep appreciation for the skill and tradition that make karate what it is today. As you progress in your training, you could feel yourself getting stronger, both physically and mentally. The teachings of the masters took hold in your heart, and you embraced the noble spirit that lay at the core of this ancient martial art. And before you knew it, you were at the top of your game. You were a true master of karate and an embodiment of the prestige and honor that had defined the Okinawan aristocracy for centuries. You had lived the life of the true pioneers of karate, a life to be emulated by all who seek to understand the full depth and beauty of this discipline. From that day on, you carried the spirit of the Okinawan nobles with you, always striving to preserve the tradition and knowledge of karate for future generations to come. And so, you lived out the rest of your days as a true warrior, a master of martial arts, and a proud representative of the Okinawan aristocracy. In conclusion, the true history of karate is one of royalty, not roughnecks. The Okinawan and Western aristocracies played pivotal roles in the development and spread of their respective martial arts, with the resources, knowledge, and influence to ensure its survival and evolution into the respected forms of self-defense they are today. So let us dispel the misconceptions and embrace the true history of karate, a history of prestige, skill, and royalty. If you like what you see here and you wanna see more, click right here to see more. For now, let me wish you a wonderful day, and as always, thanks for watching.